if Hooker's theology is a cathedral, then we've investigated some of the nooks, we've looked at the side chapel, we've taken a glance at the high vault of the nave, but now we're standing in the choir looking to the altar and we see above the altar the high vault of the apse. This is the most important place within the architectonics of Hooker's theology. The matter of central importance, where Hooker is at his most contemplative, let us say. And this is Hooker's view of salvation. For Hooker, salvation is nothing less than participation in the triune life of God. Hooker envisions salvation as a kind of a descending chain of life-giving acts that originate in the Trinity, reaching down to us in the Incarnation, drawing us into union with Christ's own body through the gift of the Holy Spirit, who, bestow, who bestows upon us the graces of union with Christ and all of the manifold graces that come with the unction of participation in Christ's uh, sacred humanity, all through the instrumentality of the sacraments. So we have a chain, a descending chain of life-giving actions of God on our behalf. The Trinity, the Incarnation, the gift of the Spirit, and the sacraments all woven together in this magnificent tapestry. Interestingly, Hooker gives us this magnificent theology in a section of his of the laws of ecclesiastical polity book five that is devoted to discussing the efficacy of the sacraments he's been dealing with various um, discrete controverted issues of his day he then comes to the sacraments and he comes to a full stop and says in effect we cannot discuss the sacraments unless we discuss the church we cannot understand the church if we don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit. And we cannot understand the work of the Holy Spirit unless we understand the reality of the incarnate uh, deity uh, who is Jesus Christ. And we can't understand the incarnation unless we also discuss uh, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. So he, he comes to sacramental theology, he comes to a full stop, and he says, let us discuss the weightier and deeper matters of the Christian faith, and within that context, we can then understand the comparatively simple matter of sacramental efficacy. He writes in this uh, early section uh, discussing all of this, which is section 50 of Book 5 of the Laws, for as our natural life consisteth in the union of the body with the soul, so our life supernatural in the union of the soul with God. And as far as much there is no union of God with man without that mean between both, which is both, it seemeth requisite that we first consider how God is in Christ, then how Christ is in us, and how the sacraments do serve to make us partakers of Christ. So we'll first consider how God is in Christ, Trinity and Incarnation, then how Christ is in us, Spirit and Church, and then how the sacraments serve to make us partakers of Christ, the instrumental efficacy of the sacraments. So you see, uh, Hooker's thought is architectonic. Rather than get into skirmishes regarding sacramental efficacy, uh, what he does rather is place it within this magnificent context of the soaring theology, the soaring vault of the highest and deepest matters of Christian believing. So again, we have a life, uh, excuse me, a descending chain of life-giving acts originating in the Trinity. So let's look at each of the links within this descending chain in order to understand what Hooker uh, has to say to us regarding the matter of our salvation. Hooker starts with the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and here he has uh, 
perfectly orthodox, drawing deeply on the wells of Nicene theology that comes to us from the fourth century. As the fully divine Son of God, Christ participates eternally in the life of God. So the, the first link, so to speak, in this descending chain of our salvation is the union Christ has with the Father eternally as the eternally begotten Son of God the Father. So there's a kind of primordial gift that exists within the very life of God, which then forms the basis of everything God will do on our behalf in the economy of salvation. So he begins with the within the imminent trinity itself. Within the very life of God, there is the gift, the gift of uh, the self-giving love that constitutes the very life of the triune God. He says, by the gift of eternal generation, Christ hath received of the Father one and in number the self-same substance with the Father, which the Father hath of himself. So here we have the eternal generation, which is the self-gift of the Father, whereby he pours out upon the Son, thus constituting the Son's eternal personhood, uh, his own substance. This is the beginning of our salvation, originating within God's own triune life. However, the, the, the life of the Trinity, which is a life of perfect self-giving love between the persons of the Trinity, uh, does not remain to us a closed circle. Rather, there is another link to the chain that extends toward us, and the first is, well, there are many links in the chain, but the first link that causes the, the otherwise closed circle of, Christ, of the, the divine life of the Trinity to be extended outward to us. The first link is the Incarnation. In the Incarnation, Christ brings human nature into that life-giving, into a life-giving participation in God's own triune life. So, in the Incarnation, what Hooker is saying, human nature is brought into this eternal relationship of the Son to the Father, whereby the Son receives from the Father the very substance of divinity. And they, the exchange of life between the persons, human nature is brought into that exchange of life. Hooker writes, The union, therefore, of the flesh, that is the flesh of Christ, with deity is to that flesh a gift of principal grace and favor. For by virtue of this grace, man is really made God, a creature exalted above the dignity of all creatures. So Christ, according to Orthodox incarnational theology, is a creature insofar as he has taken to himself, assumed a real human nature. But because that human nature now belongs to the divine Son of God, that human nature, that creaturely nature, is drawn into a participation in God's own life, thus being elevated over uh, every other human creature. For this human creature has been made truly God. So you see that uh, that circle of divine life has been opened up to include the human nature of Christ, and therefore uh, Christ as a man participates in the life of God. Uh, here's how Hooker articulates this uh, beautiful and magnificent point. His incarnation causeth him also as man now to be also in the Father and the Father to be in him. For in that he is man, he receiveth life from the Father as from the fountain of that ever-living divinity, which in the person of the Word hath combined itself with manhood, and doth thereunto impart such life as to no other creature besides him is communicated. In other words, 
eternally the Son receives the very divine life uh, of the Father. Uh, in fact, the Son is the one who is eternally begotten of the Father, and therefore he is by virtue of his sharing in the Father's own divine life. However, due to the incarnation, he now receives the divine life uh, of the Father, not only as the divine Son, but also as a human creature, as man. So man has been, or human nature has now been brought into the divine life, participating in the life of the Trinity. Which means the grace of God's own life has been bestowed first upon Christ himself, the firstborn of all creation. Hooker sums up this kind of thought by saying that Christ is by three degrees a receiver. No matter how we look at Christ, he is one who receives from the Father. And he's a receiver in three degrees. Uh, let me read this quotation and then I'll unpack it a little bit. Christ is by three degrees a receiver. First, in that he is the Son of God. Secondly, in that his human nature hath had the honor of union with deity bestowed upon it. Thirdly, in that by means thereof sundry eminent graces have flowed as effects from deity into that nature which is coupled with it. On Christ, therefore, there is bestowed the gift of eternal generation, the gift of union, and the gift of unction. So Christ is by three degrees of a receiver. He is eternally a receiver in that he receives the divine life eternally from the Father in uh, his uh, generation from the Father. He's eternally begotten. However, he also receives as a man the gift of union with the triune divine life. And because of that union with the life of God that he has as a man, uh, his human nature is perfectly sanctified, which is called the gift of unction. All the graces that could come into a human nature, perfecting that human nature and sanctifying it, Christ now receives in his own human nature. So thus the very flesh and blood and human nature of Christ is sanctified and as Hooker even makes bold to say, deified. So in Christ, all the graces are stored up and perfected in his very human nature. His flesh itself has been rendered life-giving. Hooker has not yet said how this grace of union with God uh, comes to us. Um, and so therefore, he must say more. So he's talked about... First, the first chain, uh, the eternal love of the Trinity. The second link in the chain, which is the incarnation, whereby human nature is brought into that eternal circulation of the divine love and life. That is now extended to us, you other human beings, uh, through the Holy Spirit, or what Hooker calls the participation of the Holy Spirit. Here is the third link where Hooker has much to say about the Spirit and the Church. Uh, let me sum this up, and then we'll get into various quotations that um, renders this uh, clear. Through the Holy Spirit, what Hooker calls the participation of the Holy Spirit, we are incorporated into Christ as his body, the Church, thereby receiving that life-giving power of his sanctified flesh. So in the, the incarnation itself, Christ's own human flesh and human nature have been perfectly sanctified and deified. That becomes effectual for us insofar as we are united to that sanctified and deified flesh through the operation of the Holy Spirit, whereby now we, human persons, are brought into the same relationship that Christ's human nature has with the triune God. So it's as if the, the grace of the incarnation is extended out through the work of the Holy Spirit to include all of the church as Christ's own body.
Christ's flesh has been deified. We receive that life of God through our union with Christ's flesh, which constitutes us as Christ's own body. What holds this notion together, all, this idea together, is the notion of participation. We have a real participation in uh, Christ's own body, his sanctified flesh. He writes, participation is that mutual inward hold which Christ hath of us and we of him, in such sort that each possesseth, possesseth other by way of special interest, property, and inherent copulation. So special interest, we possess everything that pertains to Christ now pertains to us. So if Christ is the beloved son of the Father, we become the beloved sons and daughters of the Father. If Christ's human nature has certain properties like perfection, holiness, uh, then our human nature, our own lives, are characterized by those same properties. So special interest, property, and inherent copulation through intimate union with Christ. Uh, this word copulation is interesting. It's changed meaning since Hooker used it, but uh, in a way that's continuous with Hooker's own use. Copulation, of course, well, you know what that means. Uh, Hooker is thinking in terms of a one flesh union that we have with Christ, which is the most intimate union imaginable. Read this next quotation. For in him, we actually are, by our actual incorporation into that society, the church, which hath him for their head, and doth make together with him one body. For which cause, by virtue of this mystical conjunction, we are of him and in him, even as though our very flesh and bones should be made continuate with his. Hooker takes the Pauline notion of the body of Christ with utmost seriousness. Uh, the body of Christ for Hooker is not a metaphor. There are metaphorical aspects to it, but fundamentally the notion of the body of Christ is not a metaphor, but a literal reality. Uh, one that exceeds our grasp and is mystical in its connotations, but literal nonetheless. We are actually, literally, Christ's body because we are united to Christ's own flesh, and our own flesh and blood, so to speak, is made continuate with Christ's own flesh and blood. We are organs of his body, members of his body. We are made, through the grace of the Holy Spirit, one flesh with Christ. And of course, that flesh of Christ has been perfectly united to the triune life of God, which means now through the mystery of the mystical body of Christ and our union with Christ's flesh through the Holy Spirit, we are now, as the church, drawn into a participation in the divine life of the Trinity. So you see how we have another link in the chain of life-giving acts for our salvation. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. In the Incarnation, Christ's human nature is adopted into the life of the Trinity. Thus, Christ's human nature is filiated, so to speak. And then through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we human beings are drawn into Christ's own flesh and thus into uh, the life of the Trinity. Uh, this next quotation is uh, my favorite. Uh, what Hooker deploys here is a figural reading of Genesis chapter 2 regarding Adam and Eve. Uh, in the one flesh union that they enjoy with one another uh, that sets the stage for every subsequent one flesh union between man and woman uh, in the story of the creation of Eve being drawn out of Adam's rib such that they are really one flesh. And Eve is therefore, uh, as Adam says, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Hooker writes, the church is in Christ as Eve 
was in Adam. Yea, by grace we are, every one of us, in Christ, and in his church, as by nature we are in those our first parents. God made Eve of the rib of Adam, and his church he frameth out of the very flesh, the very wounded and bleeding side of the Son of Man. His body crucified and his blood shed for the world are the true elements of that heavenly being, which maketh us such as himself is of whom we come. For which cause the words of Adam may fitly be the words of Christ concerning his church, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Uh, Hooker's drawing on a venerable tradition of patristic exegesis that sees in the pierced side of Christ on the cross um, a, a figural fulfillment of Eve being formed out of the side or the rib of Adam. And furthermore, the blood and the water that pours forth from the side of Christ is, so to speak, the birth of the church, which comes forth from uh, the, the side of Christ as blood and water flow forth. And of course, how are we incorporated into Christ's own body through the waters of baptism and then continually through our share in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. So as Eve was drawn forth from the flesh of Adam, out of the side of Adam, so also the, Christ, the church is drawn forth out of the side of the new Adam. And as Adam could say of the first Eve, so also Christ can say of the church, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Don't you see what Hooker is saying here is the intimacy of union we have with Christ uh, is as great as and intimate as could be imagined. We are continuate, he said earlier, with Christ's own flesh. We are quite truly his body. And therefore, whatever graces are enjoyed by Christ's own human nature now become ours because we are Christ's own body. And this is all accomplished, says Hooker, through the work of the Holy Spirit who unites us with Christ's own life-giving flesh, thereby constituting us as the church, the body of Christ. He writes at the end of this section, of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. Therefore, seeing therefore that Christ is in us by a quickening spirit, the first degree of communion with Christ must needs consist in the participation of his spirit. So to review what we've um, come to so far, we have three chain or three links in the chain now connected. Uh, the first link, which is the Trinitarian link of the Son to the Father. Second link in this descending chain is the drawing of human nature into the Son's relationship to the Father. And then this is extended out to us, individual human beings, uh, through the gift of the Spirit who unites us to Christ's flesh, constituting us as his body, and then drawing us up into uh, the top uh, link in the chain, uh, which is the Son's relationship to the Father. Therefore, participation is a key uh, idea for Hooker. We've already seen this uh, weeks ago when we looked at Hooker's doctrine of justification. Um, our incorporation into Christ, let me just say a word about this where Hooker has some distinctions to make uh, before adding the final link to the chain. Our incorporation in Christ, or our participation um, of the Spirit, uh, as his body leads to our justification and sanctification here, and in the world to come, our glorification. So Hooker um, makes certain distinctions in how we experience and how the work of Christ applies to us. 
there are different modes then, so to speak, in our participation in Christ. So for all his talk about participation, uh, Hooker still demonstrates here that he is quite clearly a Reformed theologian making, let's say, the, the distinctions a Reformed theologian must make between justification and sanctification. So, But notice how he ties them all together with the notion of participation. Thus, we participate Christ partly by imputation, as when those things which he did and suffered for us are imputed unto us for our righteousness, partly by habitual and real infusion, as when grace is inwardly bestowed while we are on earth, and afterwards most fully, more fully both our souls and bodies are made like unto his glory. So participation in Christ has uh, brings along with it various distinctions between imputation and justification. Uh, infusion, which is sanctification, and then ultimately in the age to come, our perfect glorification whereby we are rendered fully glorious um, uh, by virtue of our perfect union with God. Or as he put it in his learned discourse of justification, a wonderful quotation, there is a glorifying righteousness of men in the world to come, there is a justifying and sanctifying righteousness here. The righteousness wherewith we shall be clothed in the world to come is both perfect and inherent. That whereby we are justified is perfect, but not inherent. That whereby we are sanctified, inherent, but not perfect. Perfectly stated. So I mentioned that. I pause there for just a moment just to uh, highlight this important fact. Hooker clearly is working in a Catholic mode here, insofar as he is drawing deeply upon the wells of patristic theology in talking about Trinity, incarnation, deification, real mystical union through the Spirit with the, with the, the sanctified flesh of Christ. And yet there's no conflict between this uh, these Catholic considerations, so to speak, and the reform distinctions that he um, also feels compelled to make. Uh, so Hooker's working in a time where uh, reform theology hasn't been so narrowed uh, that he has to worry about sounding over overly Catholic. Uh, uh, reform theology was rather, for Hooker, one way of retrieving the Catholic tradition. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Third, Hooker is discussing in this section sacramental theology, but of course he's discussed Trinity, Incarnation, Spirit, and Church, all of these other considerations that seem very far removed from the sacraments. And yet, this is the context within which sacramental theology must be understood. The Holy Spirit bestows this grace of union and participation in the sanctified flesh of Christ, which draws us into a union with the, the very triune life through the instrumentality of the sacraments. It's as if the, the life-giving chain uh, descending from the heavens goes from Trinity to incarnation to spirit and now communicated to us through the very lowly instruments of the sacraments that draw us into a union with Christ. Uh, what Hooker points out is that the physicality of the sacraments is, uh, so to speak, a concession to our bodily nature. We are bodily creatures, which means we, we, we look to receive gifts in a bodily manner. It's not enough just to have Zoom meetings. Uh, we also desire real fleshly union with those whom we love. Uh, and God knows this, and so he doesn't Zoom in in a Zwinglian kind of fashion. Rather, he, he comes to us in, a ver in the very physical means of the sacraments, putting, let's say, bread in, into our hands, wine into our mouths, water upon our bodies. Through these very physical means, uh, God gives us the greatest gift imaginable, which is his own life given to us through the flesh of Christ, now coming to us by the agency of God's own spirit. So the, the humble sacraments for Hooker are caught up, so to speak, within this magnificent 
descending chain of life-giving acts originating in the Trinity itself. Here's how Hooker puts it. This is therefore the necessity of the sacraments, that saving grace which Christ originally is or hath for the general good of the church, by sacraments he severally deriveth into every member thereof. Sacraments serve as the instruments of God to that end and purpose, moral instruments, the use whereof is in our hands, the effect in his. So through the instruments of these physical means of the sacraments, uh, God's own life comes into us um, by uniting us to Christ's own body. Uh, Hooker then goes on in the subsequent section to discuss uh, what this means in terms of the efficacy of baptism, and then in the following section, the efficacy of the Holy Eucharist. Uh, you've already read the section where he treats of the Holy Eucharist, so I hope that as you think back to that reading from a few weeks ago, you can now realize the architectonic context uh, within which that sort of more minute conversation uh, takes place. Uh, so let's first look at his baptismal theology. Uh, you won't be surprised that Hooker uh, considers baptism to be an efficacious sign. Uh, let me read this quotation, and then I'll, I'll make a point about it. God will have it, that is, baptism, embraced not only as a sign or token of what we receive, but also as an instrument or mean whereby we receive grace. Because baptism is a sacrament which God hath instituted in his church, to the end that they which receive the same might be incorporated into Christ. And so, through his most precious merit, obtain as well that saving grace of imputation, which taketh away all our former guiltiness, as also that infused divine virtue of the Holy Ghost, which giveth powers, giveth to the powers of the soul their first disposition toward newness of life. In other words, through the means of baptism, through these very, the very physical means of, you know, the washing with water, uh, we are incorporated into Christ, and in the context of our union with Christ, we now uh, receive the dual benefits of justification imputation, forgiveness of our sins, and sanctification, the gift of the Holy Spirit who begins a new work within us, taking away our heart of stone and putting within us a heart of flesh. I would just like to point out that quite clearly uh, Hooker, at this early stage of Anglican identity, in the time of the late Reformation, English Reformation, Hooker clearly takes a position for baptismal regeneration, which becomes a hot-button issue in the later uh, fighting between Anglo-Catholics and Evangelical Anglicans. Uh, regardless of where Cranmer might come down on this issue, uh, it's quite clear that for Hooker, baptismal regeneration is uh, very much a part of the Reformed theology of the Elizabethan Church. Um, and I think that's probably generally true of most of the Elizabethan theologians. Um, we'll, we'll bring up this uh, matter of baptismal regeneration more in a few weeks, um, but just notice the, the standard here at this time is that baptismal regeneration is clearly the teaching of Hooker, as well as uh, the, the stable position of the Elizabethan Church. As baptism incorporates us into Christ, thus giving us a share in all of the graces of union with Christ, so also does the Holy Eucharist. Hooker writes, The bread and cup are his body and blood, because they are causes instrumental upon the receipt whereof the participation of his body and blood ensueth. The real presence of Christ's most blessed body and blood is therefore not sought for in the sacrament, but in the worthy receiver of the sacrament. The fruit of the Eucharist is the participation of the body and blood of Christ. So through the sacraments, the Spirit unites us with the body of Christ, which then gives us a share in the very triune life of God. So the 
chain descends uh, and the chain reascends. The chain descends down to us uh, in the ordinary Christian gathering or receiving the sacraments, which then draws us up like an anchor piercing the veil, drawing us upward behind it into the very triune life of God. I, I hope that um, I've communicated this vision in such a way that you, you know and feel some of its magnificence. Well, with that said, let me simply draw a conclusion uh, and close this lecture. The question whether Hooker is a more Protestant or Catholic theologian, in my view, is probably the wrong question and involves a category error and anachronism. Hooker lived in a time when Reformed theology was broad enough to embrace a revival of interest in, let's say, Cyril of Alexandria and St. John Damascene, as well as the expected dependence upon St. Augustine. Interestingly, in the time of Hooker, there was even something of a recovery of the theology of Thomas Aquinas among various Reformed theologians. All this to say, the Reformed theolo theological movement of Hooker's day was a broad movement that had yet narrowed itself uh, as later Reformed theology would do. Uh, the definition of uh, Reformed theology wasn't so narrow as it became in subsequent decades. So Hooker is clearly a Catholic theologian in a very substantive sense, as we have seen from this discussion of his soteriology. But this doesn't mean that he wasn't also a Reformed theologian according to the standards of his day. Now, what I would say is this capaciousness of Hooker sets the st uh, is an important insight that sets the stage for later Anglican agonies. What happens when Reformed theology begins to define itself more narrowly? More narrowly than Hooker defines it, let's say. Well, inevitably, a Catholic theology will then define itself against that more narrow Reformed theology. So then what Hooker could join together rather uncomplicatedly will be put asunder by competing Anglican identities, both of which can rightfully lay claim to a portion of Hooker's seamless garment, but in the process they tear that garment apart. So it's as if Hooker can embrace within his architectonic theology uh, much of what Catholics and Reformed theologians want to say. However, when Reformed theology becomes to be more narrowly defined, there now is a distinct Catholic Anglican identity that's defined over against it. Now, each of them can appeal in different ways to Richard Hooker, uh, but without the breadth uh, and uh, seamless garment of Richard Hooker, which I think goes a long way in explaining later Anglican struggles. Uh, all of the various parties within Anglicanism appeal to Hooker, but they can't appeal to all of Hooker, for he's broader than any one of these subsequent parties or competing uh, Anglican identities. So, with a measure of sadness, let us then recognize that with Hooker we close one chapter, which is the chapter of classical Anglicanism, we could say, and we open another chapter, which is what I call agonistic Anglicanisms, various competing Anglican identities that have a fragment of what Hooker had in a capacious architectonic unity. More on that in the coming weeks. I hope and pray that you enjoy your reading of Hooker this week, and I look forward to our conversation together. Goodbye, and God bless you.